The Palace Verdes Women's Club is one of the most prestigious philanthropic organizations in Palace Verdes. And on November 9th, they're going to be holding their prestigious Authors Luncheon. Come with me as we meet some of these authors. We're talking with uh, Jerry Solomon, who has a book with an absolutely incredible title, and it's called A Man's Guide to Food Foreplay. Wow, I mean, <laughs> tell me a little about how you came up with that title and what the book is about. Uh, the book really started from, uh, I have a son. He was in college in Boston. And, you know, for a kid who's raised with food around him all the time, um, he wasn't that much into cooking. So I used to get these phone calls from school where he'd say, I'm going out with somebody, what can I do? You have a recipe, I'm buying this, the roommate, so on. So that sort of was the impetus to creating the book. But when he said, did you have a recipe, I mean, does he know you as a cook or? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been, been married for nearly 37 years. My wife has cooked um, maybe five times. And not for anything other than the fact that she doesn't like cooking. So she was fortunate she married a man who <laughs> loved to cook. So I've always cooked. My son has always been around food. Um, he just enjoys it as a consumer. But you know, that's a very provocative title. What, I mean, when you think about what those words are, I, I know this is a family type show, but what exactly, how did you decide on that, that title? That's, I know it's, it's newsworthy, it's newsmaking, but how did you come up with that? Um, in actuality, the book is really about romance. Foreplay in this case is the idea that we all use foreplay in relationships. Food, in this case, becomes one that is, um, everybody does it. Everybody shares food stories. Everybody shares this. So to be able to take someone that you're interested in spending time with, for example, and inviting them over and just making a meal for them special is really special. It's unique. Um, but to be able to go out to a restaurant and appreciate that same idea of what food is about. Um, I wanted it to be the kind of book where a young man or really a person of any age could pick it up. They'll learn how to, it's really the guidebook. That's what it's about but more than anything. Is it for men or women or both? I think it's really for, ultimately can be for everyone, but it's directed at men. Okay. Because men, when I first, when I was younger, very few men cooked. Um, you Are more men cooking now? Oh, much more, much more. I think the biggest um, influence right now is going to be the Food Network. I think there's more people, more men who watch these kinds of programs. Um, I think they are more open to the idea that it's not difficult. But if I was watching this and I'd say to myself now, all right, that's nice, I should get this book. But what are the recipes? I mean, do they zero in on one specific thing? No, the recipes are actually, <clears throat> they're, uh, they're actually all based on a story. And the story is about somebody I spent time with and recipes that I did for this individual. Okay. So there's stories is about a young woman that I met in New York early on doing something that I would love to tell everybody, if you ever get a chance to do it, you have to try the Fancy Food Show. Okay. The Fancy Food Show is held twice a year, usually in New York City and San Francisco. You wind up going into this arena that has 
maybe 300, 400 vendors, and all they sell is, all they represent is food. Okay. You don't go in to buy, you go in to sample. And you just wander around, up and down aisles, tasting chocolates and mustards and everything that you can imagine in the food industry. So after 10 minutes, you're completely full. Well, yeah, but you don't care because you, it, you're so intrigued by looking for your favorite type of items. Yeah. And throughout this, there's young women and young men who are handing out <laughs> all the all, samples. All these free goodies. You know, I've got to ask you, um, I'm kind of a creative guy myself, and I, I know how hard the creative world is. How difficult was it to get your book published? I mean, have you written other books before this? No, this is actually my first endeavor. Hey, terrific. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, because I've been a generally freelance kind of worker all my adult life, mm -hmm. I've always looked at I have all day that I need to fill. So I'm either filling it getting paid or I'm filling it by doing other things. So okay. I'm always creating. This book came that way. It just sort of over a year manifested itself. Um, I found a publisher online. It's, I don't know if it's considered an on-demand published book, but that's what it's, I represent it as. It's a publishing company um, that is called Strategic Publishing. Okay. And they represent a, a lot of authors all around the world. And at this point, I've done fairly well, I think, for an unknown author, just in a sense self-promoting it. Two final questions. Sure, of course. One is, um, knowing the creative field as I do, we all face rejection. How, how do you face rejection? I'm sure that you tried before. You obviously didn't give up and you kept on pushing. How did you, did you face that? Um, you can't get rejected. Absolutely. You keep on trying. Right. It's, when you're in industries that are demanding that you sign your name to something, you're going to get people who love it, you're going to get people who hate it. Right. Eventually you'll find more people that love it, and you really only need one. Absolutely. You know? So this is a great way to end our conversation. Having said that, what has been the proudest moment of your life, especially as it relates to being an author? Um, other than the traditional family, son, wife things, mm -hmm. doing the book and getting it out there to me has been um, part of exactly what you described. That experience that to know it's now in a physical form. It's now out there. It's no longer just sort of rattling around in your head, in my head. And all the other type of art that I do is the same thing. You know, you have to, as an artist, I just like it being out there. I like getting people to respond to things I do. So any aspiring author who is watching, what would you say to them? Write a book. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> Write it, get it out there, you know, publish it yourself, whatever you have to do. At least that way, you can say you did it. And keep on trucking. And right, right. You always have to keep going. You know, life is all about the journey. Absolutely. You know. Terrific. Thank you very much for coming. John, in. thank you. I see that we have a book here called Pete's Night Eyes, and you told me before the show that uh, this was all about kids. So, first of all, I'm intrigued with the title, and what got you into writing books for kids? Well, I'm actually, I was a lawyer and a crisis manager. I have written a couple books in the past that are law books or history books, but I wanted to write a book about the beauty of the night and to try to teach kids as well as their parents how beautiful it is at night, but you've got to leave the lights behind because the lights cause your eyes to dilate and you don't see the light, the beautiful light that comes in the night. You have light from the moon, but you also have light from the various human habitation that is in the distance. And as I'm a night painter as well as a day painter. And do you have any kids? I, I'm not, I have three kids and 11 grandkids. Woo! And this is, <laughs> this is dedicated to my grandkids as well as my kids. And Pete is my oldest grandchild. And this book goes through not only sunsets, but also the beauty of the night. And it's a quest by his grandson with his grandfather to see a ring around the moon. Now, since so many kids watch television today, do you still think, and I'm sure I know the answer, do you still think that kids can benefit from reading a book? Well, this book is meant primarily for parents to read to their very young children. This is young designed for like old. three to five-year-old children. Okay. 
and it's been it's been tested by two teachers that taught youngsters for 30 years in kindergarten as far as the words I used and how they apply to the to the to the paintings and each of these paintings tries to depict some important element of of what happens at night and how beautiful it is and how interesting it is and the effect of the moon on the earth it really has quite a bit of science in it as well as a story about a young grandchild and his, and his grandfather and the great times they're having together in this quest to see a ring around the moon which is caused by ice crystals in the, in the, uh, in the atmosphere which causes actually a, a rainbow around the moon. So you primarily see a ring around the moon in snow country, but you can see it here in the, on, on the peninsula did you with also fog. Do the, did, did you also do the painting? I did the paintings. I, this was when I first started as a, as a painter. So it's a little bit primitive as far as the art, but people tell me that probably my current style is much less appropriate for this book than these paintings that I've done for the book when I was first starting out, which I think are more consistent with what a, a young child would want to see. This is just all the chicken and egg thing. I mean, did you write the story mm -hmm. and then have the paintings, or did the paintings come first and then the words? How did that work? It was out? kind of a combination. Actually, I had a lot more words in the original uh, proposal, and then uh, these teachers said you can't have more than one or two sentences <clears throat> for really? each for each for each page. For a young child, they want one or two sentences, they will absorb that. But if there's a whole bunch of sentences, then they may lose interest. So you turn the picture, but there's a picture on every page and then some words underneath describing what's happening in an interesting way. It's very interesting because when you say a certain number of words on each page, that also means you must, I'm assuming, have thought about how long the book was going to be. Well, I took a class at UCLA on how to write a children's book. Really? And they told me exactly the number of pages you had to have. Which is? Uh, it's either 32 or 36. I, don't, I think the, with the cover it's 36. And so I knew how many pages I had and I had a lot of ideas as far as what I wanted to put in there. So I consolidated it down to 36. It's probably my British sense of humor, but you know, when you say they tested it out for 32 pages, I can well, just, <laughs> just sort of see all these kids, I mean, by page 33 or 34, they're all getting incredibly bored and, and sort of falling asleep. I mean, that's a very interesting uh, study to, to figure out how long well, a book should be for kids. Well, it, that, that's the, the 32 and 36 is what the teacher felt was the what most children's books, that's, that's what most children's books are for young children is that is that number of pages either you see the 36 or like 64 in other words you have to double the number of pages just that's just the way it fits together as a production okay that's a production issue rather than as far as how much attention they will pay but the idea is that you probably can read that to your your child or your grandchild in about a half hour do you favor and you'll learn a lot yourself as a absolutely. parent absolutely and and if you just take the kid out when it's full moon and have them not be surrounded by lots of, na of artificial light and let their eyes adjust to the beauty of the night. It's absolutely spectacular. Here on the peninsula, the moon shines on the water. Right, it right. shines in the top of the fog even. Right. It sh it, the lights from, from the peninsula shine through the fog and the moon's above. There's so many beautiful things that happen at night. And if you go down, like for example, down near Terranea, right. the, the moon coming up over Terranea is spectacular. I've painted it many times. It's just spectacular. Is this your first book? No. As I mentioned, I, I wrote a, a history book that was quite successful when I lived in Pasadena, a history book. And then I wrote, co-authored two law books. Do you like writing for kids as opposed to the other well, ones you've this, written? Well, this, with all these grandkids, uh, it was uh, natural for me to write a book for, their, for them, trying to, basically trying to help everybody understand what I did with my grandkids to try to introduce them to the beauties of the night. And when I kid them about you need your night eyes. Your night yeah. eyes are when you don't have artificial light around and that causes your eyes to open up to take in the, the natural light from the moon or even, even the reflections, if you study reflections coming across the water from habitation, it's across, you can even see the, you can see the lights on Catalina on a, yeah. on a, on a clear night on a clear day. at the Isthmus and also at, at the um, at, at uh, the, the main uh, area there. So has this given you ideas on other subjects to write for kids? No, I, re I'm, I really am primarily a painter and I love painting and so that's what I primarily do. I think this is my, 
this is probably my last book, although I could, I could do another book, but it was fascinating to me that you, there's so little written about the beauty of the night that first is for kids. They're afraid of the night. They're, they're, the first thing they do is turn on all the lights. And I like to tell them, don't turn on the lights. Let, let's see what we can see without. That's the night eyes. Use your night eyes. Do not use your flashlight. I know that you told me uh, you probably may not probably write another book, but having said that and thinking again about creativity, um, what advice would you give to someone who wants to write a book about kids? Well, I think the first is you have a passion for some kind of a message that you're trying to help them understand, some human uh, element or some, or some natural element, some scientific subject. This is kind of scientific. A lot of the ideas that are in here are teaching them some very basic science about the moon, its effect on the, uh, on the, on the earth, uh, and, and, and also like the phases of the moon, the waxing and the waning. Right, you can look right. up and tell whether it's getting larger or getting smaller by which side is illuminated. If the right side is illuminated, it's getting larger. It's, it's waxing, it's waning or getting smaller if the left side is illuminated. So there's a lot of interesting little, my, my young granddaughter was probably four years old and I read the book to her. We're riding along in the car and she looked up and said, the, the moon is waxing. Wow. So it's not, it's not, it's, it's something that's simple but very interesting and she sure dazzled everybody else in the car. <laughs> well, you've certainly, you've certainly intrigued me and even though it's for kids, I think I'm going to go home and uh, A, read it to my grandkids, but also read it to myself. Thank you very much Thank for you coming Thank you very much. In. I enjoyed this. Take Thank care. you very much. All the titles of our books and authors today are all fascinating, but this next author is absolutely incredible because I've talked to him on the telephone. But the title of his book is absolutely wonderful. It's called Smother. First of all, that makes me think of mother, and then it also makes me think of smothering someone. So first of all, Adam Chester, welcome to the show. Thank Tell you. me a little bit how you came to come up with that intriguing title. Uh, I think it just came to me one day when I realized uh, what and who my mother was and is. Uh, she's How old were you when that happened? About four. About and, four. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've been planning for this my whole life. I just want you to know. Okay. Uh, but but she's a smothering mother. She always has been, and uh, and that doesn't mean I I dislike her. I hate her. I have any <laughs> ill will towards her. But I have needed a heck of a lot of therapy and, uh, <laughs> you know. Professional therapy? Every kind of therapy you can mention. Okay. Yeah. Is Has there, it helped you? Um, I'm not really sure. I, the, it helped the book, let's say that. The, the book was able to come out from all the therapy that uh, I undertook. How did this come about? I mean, did you one day say to your mother, listen, mom, this is absolutely awful. I can't stand oh, it. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. Write a book? No, no, no. She had no idea. First of all, the, the book is basically, um, uh, I, I've collected about 1,300 letters from, from my mother. Good heavens. And, uh, well, she, she loves to write, and, and I'll explain that in a second, but I saved all these letters in, in a huge box because I knew one day I'd need them as evidence that this was happening. <laughs> so, so, so the day came when my wife said, you know what, you've got this huge box in the garage. Please go in there and see what's, what's it all about. And I went in there and, and I was opening letters for the very first time. Because I would get letters from my mom and just put them in the box unopened. Because I couldn't bear to read any more letters about grapes being good for my bowel movement. I, I just... <laughs> There had to be a limit, so... But what if she said to you, Adam, did you get my letter about? I mean, would you just sort of... Well, I'd have to say yes, yeah. I'd have to say yes, because I'm sure I got it. I mean, you know. Okay. Uh, but it was in this box, and, uh, and one day I opened it up and started going through it, and I started this blog that was based on a title of one of her letters that was, Please Don't Eat Sushi, Love Mom. <laughs> and that was the letter. And it came with an attachment, this little... Uh, um, a newspaper clipping about how they found this huge worm in a man's stomach from eating sushi. Oh my goodness. So it became my life's <laughs> intention, intent at that time to do nothing but eat sushi because <laughs> I like sushi, you know? You know, so but, that's where it all started. But did you 
tell your mom, hey, mom, I'm going to write a book about this? And if you did, did she say, Adam, absolutely not? No, no. In no. fact, uh, the book came as quite a surprise to her. I'm sure it uh, did. <laughs> and, uh, and my agent uh, made me or requested that I have my mom sign a legal document so she couldn't sue me. And so, I, Mom, do you mind signing this? It's a little paper, nothing, you know. And of course she did, and, and here we are today. And now she's, she loves, you know, she's a little mortified by the fact that people are reading this. But then again, she loves this. This is what she's always wanted because she's getting to spend more time with me. For people out there who are aspiring writers and journalists and all, knowing how hard it is to get an agent, let me ask you that question. How hard was it to get an agent for uh, you? You know, it, it came about in a very interesting way. Um, it, it wasn't that hard, but I don't want to toot my horn here. I mean, I knew that I had something that people could relate to. And, and everybody's got... A smothering mother. A, yeah, either they have a smothering mother, they know a smothering mother, or like this, this wonderful woman I was speaking with out there had the complete opposite mother who didn't care to the sense of worry. So I'm finding, and my mother is meeting a lot of people when we've appeared together uh, who relate to this. And, and I, love, I love that people are getting this. But getting back to your agent, how yes. did you find an agent? How did I find an agent? Well... Uh, you Googled it, it probably. Yeah, no, no, it was uh, through a friend who referred me, and, uh, and, and I got this agent at uh, William Morris. It, it's wow. a wonderful agency. It's a wonderful book publishing company, uh, Abrams Books. They do Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Uh, they're terrific. You obviously have a very offbeat sense of humor, and you and I really connected on the telephone. Yes. Um, does your mother have that same kind of, I don't want to say crazy, but that, you know, oh, really... No, please say crazy. Crazy? Okay. Please say it again. <laughs> no, uh, my mom is, is nuts, but she's a different kind of nuts. You know, she, she's very organic in the things that she says, and it's been hysterical watching her relate to normal people when we do these book tours, and the things she comes up with are, are phenomenal. How does she feel though about you calling her nuts? She would agree. She's she, the first person that would agree that she's absolutely certifiable, which makes this all the more great because I'm not saying something she doesn't already know. How long has the book been out? Uh, since May 1st. Uh, wow, that's really brand new. Yeah. Do you have any plans to do a follow-on? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, with all, how many letters have you got? Uh, there's about 1,300, but the next one is going to be Smother in Law. Smother in Law? Yeah, I think so. So that, <laughs> that raises My a, poor mother in law is probably going to watch us and go, oh, no, it's not. Not going to be that. So you've got letters from your mother in law? No, that would have to take a different sort of vein because you know, she's nuts in a different way. But I, I'm surrounded by nuts, is the bottom line. And let me ask you the same question I've asked the other authors here. What advice, it's always interesting when you watch a show like this to talk to, you know, experts, and you're obviously an expert writer. What advice would you give to someone that wanted to write a book? And this is obviously a very offbeat type of book. Yeah. Sometimes it's very difficult to sell and market something offbeat. What advice would you give to someone that is trying to do that? My advice is to save everything. Save, save letters, save notes, save anything that you can that you'll some you'll, you'll that rings true to you that that you'll want to write about one day, okay. which is what happened with these letters. And two final questions. Yes. I can't imagine anybody in your life rejecting you because you're such a funny guy and oh, you have such a great personality. But how have you, if you have, how have you handled rejection? Terribly. I, you know, I mean, there, there have been some girls that I dated in the past who really didn't get along with this whole, you know, mother thing going on here with the letters and, ooh, it's kind of, you know, uh, you know, but, yeah, I, I you try get over to get it. along with everybody. Yeah. Uh, Timothy Kasdan in the fifth grade, that didn't work out too well. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, but everybody else. <laughs> Whatever that means. Yeah. I guess the last question is, what has been the proudest moment of your life, especially as it re refers to this book publishing? This book. Okay, that, that's, that's a good question. And the answer is, my uh, eight-year-old son and I were walking into a Barnes & Noble, and he saw my book on display, 
and he said, Dad, that's your book. And I thought, oh, that's, that was just a very proud moment. Uh, very touching, yeah, very touching. Very cool. Thank you for coming in. You've been a really nifty interview, and oh, Brits are noted you. for understatement. It's always good to talk to, you know, really, really with it people. You certainly are with thank it, you. and thank you very much oh, for coming in. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. In uh, fair play to all, we're also going to have a lady on this show, and our lady is Jean Adair Schreiber. So, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm intrigued. Uh, Jean has written a book called The Einstein Solution. Um, everyone, I'm sure, knows who Einstein was. So, let me ask you first of all, how did you come up with the title for this book? And what was the sort of genesis for the whole thing? And basically, briefly, what is it all about? Okay, the genesis was uh, that I think in stories, you know, people think, in, my husband's an engineer. He thinks in facts and measurements and... And buildings. So, well, sort of. And, yeah. uh, people think in different ways. I think in stories. And when Einstein was made man of the century, I couldn't think of a story. I grew up across the street from him, but really? when, oh yeah, right, right directly across the street. When you're a girl who can barely do long division, um, I'm you, in there too. <laughs> you don't know what to say to a math genius, you know. It, because it was World War II, this is a fiction book, but it's based on that fact and others. Um, so I didn't have any stories about Einstein. My brother did. He once went over there to collect newspapers and... From Einstein's house? Yeah. Well, he was very... It's a small house, uh, John, very small, unpretentious. And he lived very simply without a car. Uh, my mother used to say all very well for him, but his... Uh, stepdaughter and niece have to walk up to the market in the snow and trudge the groceries home. My mother was not so admiring. But the so fascinating thing about that is that when you think about Einstein, I mean, you have this image of this tremendously, I don't know, influential, powerful, interesting guy, and you sort of, at least I do, picture him living in this, I don't know about a mansion, but to, <clears throat> to listen to what you're telling me paints a whole different picture of him. Right. Well, because it was wartime, it was gas rationing, and that meant that I walked a mile or so to my school, and he walked the other way to the Institute of Advanced Study. So we passed. So, but I had no stories, you know. So I started thinking about it um, in relation to young people. I, I like to write for younger people. And... Um, and at the same time, there were other things that happened. I, I had read there it was a lot of anti-Semitic prejudice, even while we're over fighting Hitler, who's about as anti-Semitic as you can get. Absolutely. <laughs> so Absolutely. It seemed rather <laughs> ironic that our forces were over in Europe, you know, fighting this. And yet at home, girls in a private school could not accept a new Jewish girl. She happened to be the first in the school, but they just weren't very open to newcomers. Princeton was very small before the war, 10,000 people. Given what you just told me about Einstein and the proximity of your house to his, the obvious question is, did you ever meet him yourself? I walked by and I, you know, kind of nodded. You <laughs> he didn't like, he, he called Princeton people a collection of puny demigods on stilts. What? He was not fond of Tell me that again. What did he say? A collection of puny demigods on stilts. <laughs> so he, my grandmother, used to give Sunday night suppers, just buffets. Right. And <clears throat> occasionally his stepdaughter and his niece, or actually it was his secretary by that time, would come. But he never came. He didn't. He had friends and, well, like the Secretary of State or people like that, but he didn't care to socialize, you know, in town. So I never could meet him that way. I would have had to say, hi, Mr. Einstein. Do you, th I mean, we, I don't know how old you were when this took place, but was part of it, I mean, were you shy or? 
I've no. never been shy. Never been shy. I just mm -mm. didn't have anything to say. The girl up the street, now this is a true story. Um, I think she's died. I know her name, but maybe I better not say it. Uh, but it is true. It's in all the books. She went up and offered him uh, brownies if he'd do her math homework. <laughs> what, but we all knew, what a great story. We all knew Ed Laid <laughs> was a nut. And he answered that um, it wouldn't be fair to the other children. So. so this particular book, is this your first book or one of many? How does that work Neither. out? Neither. It's one of two. One of two. Right. And the other one is about? The other one is about an old farmhouse. Again, it, it's, there's truth in it. That was our old farmhouse. You know, an ancient, ancient farmhouse in Massachusetts that had to be sold. And that's my germ of an idea. This one, it was looking for an Einstein story. The other thing that intrigues me about talking to you is, you know, neither you nor I are 20 anymore. And for, really? pe for, pe <laughs> for people watching, for people watching, looking at you and listening to you, um, I'm sure some of them were saying to them, to themselves, how could I, you know, let's say I'm 50 and I want to start writing. I don't necessarily want to ask you how old you were when you started writing, but I guess that evolves into the question, what advice would you give to people who want to write a book but sort of say, well, I'm too old to start writing? What, what, how would you encourage them? Well, that's the nice thing about the arts is it's never, you're never too old. You just need, I think, if you're going to start without ever having done it before, you need some subject you feel very strongly about that makes it worthwhile. And you obviously felt very strongly about this. I did. I feel very strongly about prejudice. And I just found out some very interesting facts about Einstein, who felt very strongly about racism. I just read a whole book about his attitude towards racism in Princeton. So I feel strongly about racism. I actually loved my childhood. And the other thing I think, I do a lot of book reviewing at 15th Street, volunteer for the fourth and fifth grade. And um, I try to explain to them that World War II was different than any war they might have known. We I agree with you because I grew up in London during the Blitz and well, everything. You would surely, yes. But I've got to ask you, what makes you say that? Why do you? Th I mean, I know why it was, but why do you think it was different? Well, I know it was, and I, it's in the book too. We collected scrap. We ran all over town. We hauled it in in our little wagons. Um, we bought war stamps at school, and I came home and I said to my mother, "I need more money for stamps." And she said, why? And I said, they told us we have to buy a bomb. And my mother <laughs> said, I don't think that can be true. And I said, yes, we do. We have to buy a war bomb. They said so. And, uh, you know, we really, my grandfather was head of the grass, gas rationing board. So that's why we had almost no gas. Other people chiseled a little bit. We didn't have, you know. But you grew up in this country. Yes. I say that because uh, I grew up in London, London and, yeah. you know, when I hear that, I mean, the whole rationing thing in England was completely different from, from say, what you guys I'll have say. here. After the war, you still did, yeah, you know. Yeah, for a long time. Yeah. This book, what sort of, I mean, do you feel it's a book for everybody or a certain generation or age range? Well, technically, in the world of technical book you know, thing. It's a middle grade. Um, the most popular, the most <clears throat> best selling group of books right now is YA, which is sort of teenage, the vampire books, and oh, this, yeah. the, that, Twilight, dee 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 dee. They're very yeah. good sellers. Um, I didn't want to deal with teenage, so this is just below. But I, I have a lot of adult friends who bought it and read it and enjoyed it. Won't take you long. <laughs> the last question I want to ask you is what I've asked the other authors, and that is, given your really, I think, interesting life and your perspective on racism and all those things and the culmination of writing this book, what has been in your life your proudest moment, either in your life or as it relates to writing? I heard you ask one of the authors that. 
and I, I blanked. <laughs> you blanked? You've I, led such an interesting life, though. Well, I have, but proudest. Somehow that's not a proudest, proudest. Or your greatest achievement. I mean, it must have been, when I think of all the people that want to have a book published, Three the number ten. of people that actually get them published is really very small, so that must have been an achievement for well, you. Well, it was. It was. Uh, the time that Delacorte called up and told me that I had... Uh, I'd won, you know, the rights to get my first book published. That was thrilling. But, you know, proudest, that might be three healthy babies in three years with no <laughs> anesthetic. Who knows? I, would, <laughs> I would say so. Thank you very, Thank very you. much for coming in, Jean. Very nice talking to you. Nice You're a fine, wonderful you. lady, and it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. We're talking now with the president of the Palace Fertis Women's Club, a lady by the name of Jane Thomas. Jane, first of all, welcome to you. Thank I think you. the last time you and I talked, we were sitting in a garden. We were. And it was were. a beautiful day. Uh, sitting here in the studio, you wouldn't know whether it's raining or whether That's it's a sunny true. day, but it was a lovely day it when was we a last talked. Day. The last time we talked was on the garden tour and this author's luncheon is, I suppose, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, this is, I assume, another fundraising effort on behalf of the Correct. Club? Correct. We have two fundraisers every year. One is the Garden Tour in the spring, and the other one is this Books and Authors Luncheon in November. And what sort of turnout do you expect? I know I went to one of your uh, Authors Luncheon, and it was absolutely packed. I believe last year we had 340, I think, was the was the total number. We pretty much filled the ballroom. Where is it held? At Trump, Trump, At Trump National, and we filled the ballroom last year. And let's tell our audience when that will be. It's on a Wednesday, November the 9th, and it's a luncheon. And, and if, then, pe if people want to come, um, I'm sure everyone is looking at the internet, Tell us the web address they can look at. Okay, we have, we have a website and it's www.pvwomensclub.org. Okay, I'm always impressed by organizations, especially here on the peninsula, that do all this fundraising stuff. It's a very, you know, community-spirited, community-minded effort. And so that makes me wonder, of the money that you generate from this, it goes to who and how do you well, distribute it goes, that? Uh, by the way, I want to tell you, this is our 54th Books and Authors, so I thought we need to How many? 54. Woo! Good <laughs> So we've heavens. been doing this for quite a while. Wow. Uh, and the money that we raise goes um, to scholarships for high school seniors in the Palos Verdes Peninsula, as well as some local charities like Rainbow House, uh, Harbor Interfaith, Cheer for Children, um, different organizations like that. Okay, um, if uh, obviously, you know, uh, if the PV Women's Club, obviously I, I'm not a woman and I wonder, doing all the work that you do, which I just commented on, is a very wonderful effort. If I wanted to join your organization, how would I do that? Well, you just, we have a, a very short membership application form, which you can get from any of our members or on our website. And the fee to join is $50. Oh, and, $50. And a $15 fee the first time. Okay. It's a one-time fee. And um, the only requirement is you must live in this general geographic area. For, is there any sort of time limit? I mean, could you just have moved in here? Oh, no, no, no. You can just have moved in or have, can have lived here for 30 years. It doesn't matter. Okay. The main, you know, when you look at all the civic community philanthropic clubs on the Palace Votis Peninsula, um, what sort of uh, what sort of emphasis does the Palace Verdes Women's Club place? I mean, are you just mainly a philanthropic organization? We are. We're philanthropic, and and our main goal is to support this community. But it's entirely philanthropic. And when the luncheon happens, uh, for audience members that don't know this, give me a brief overview of what takes place at that luncheon. At the Books and Authors Luncheon. Yes. Mission? Um, the, the authors will be there ahead of the luncheon and people have an opportunity to go around and meet them and have a look at their book. And then we have lunch and then each author speaks for a short length of time about his book and or his or her book and about themselves. And then following the luncheon they can go back again and purchase books or and get the authors to autograph their books or... Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much once again oh, for coming you. in thank and sharing for, with our audience all this thank stuff. Thank you for very having us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. 
Okay, so there you have it. That's the Palace Verdi's Women's Club Authors Luncheon on November the 9th, and you've met some of the fascinating authors and their books. Come see them in person on November the 9th at Trump.